I want to say a few words about the Smith Lecture. Usually the family is here to, uh, to celebrate with us and to enjoy the lecture, and today they're going to be joining us uh, by video. So, I mean, I, they won't be here, but they're going to be seeing, the, viewing the lecture by video. Uh, this lecture is named in, in, in honor of Andrew F. Smith. Andrew Smith was born in Washington, D.C. in 1963. He was the second son of Mr. David Smith and Mrs. Allen, Alice Gillen. He grew up in New Jersey, and he came to Syracuse University in 1981, where he studied economics at the Maxwell School. At Syracuse, Andrew was a member of ROTC, and he was the men and the men's swim team. And he was elected captain of the swim team in his senior year. After graduating from Syracuse in 1985, Andy worked at Chubb Insurance Corporation. He was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma a, ye a few years later, and with the support of his family and his many friends, he fought a courageous battle against the disease, but unfortunately he died on New Year's Day in 1991. Shortly after Andy's death, his family established the Andrew Sm Smith Swimming Scholarship at Syracuse University. The fund was used until 2006 to provide scholarship and financial support to student athletes on the men's swim team. When the university discontinued the men's swimming program in 2007, the family decided to transfer the funds to the economics department of the Maxwell School to support a lecture series in Andy's name. We are honored to present the third Andrew F. Smith Lecture in International Economics and Development and would like to thank Andy's family and friends for choosing to honor him through this gift to the Maxwell School's economics department. It's an honor to introduce today's speaker, someone who is both a friend to the Smith family and to Syracuse University. Jeffrey Frieden is professor of government at Harvard University. He's an expert on global economic governance, specializing in the politics of international financial and monetary relations. His work informs research in political science and international relations, as well as economics. This inter interdisciplinary reach of Jeff's work makes him an ideal speaker for the Smith Lecture, which aims to generate dialogue across the Maxwell School on, on the many challenges of economic development. Jeff Breeden is the author of, most recently, of Currency Politics, the Political Economy of Exchange Rate Policy, which was published in 2015, and with Menzi Chen, a book called Lost Decades, The Making of America's Debt Crisis and the Long Recovery, which was published in 2011, a very timely book. Frieden is also the author of Global Capitalism, its, rise, its fall and rise in the 20th, 20th century, which is used by many of our students in the International Political Economy course. So students are well familiar with you. <laughs> Jeff is also the author of Banking on the World, The Politics of American International Finance, and of Debt De uh, Development and De Democracy, Modern Political Economy in Latin America, 1965 to 1985. And he's the co-author or co-editor of over a dozen other books on related topics. His articles on the politics of international economic issues have, gener have appeared in a wide variety of scholarly and general interest publications. And beginning last year, Jeff co serves as co-chair of Harvard University's research group on the politics and economics of international finance. It's a great honor to have Jeff Frieden with us today for the Andrew F. Smith Lecture, and I ask you to welcome, help me welcome him to the podium. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. It's always a pleasure to be here at Syracuse University. I've been here many times, and it's always fun to see the beautiful campus and the beautiful weather, which is always like this, 72 degrees and sunny. Um, so wonderful to be here and wonderful to be honoring, uh, uh, the, the, to be able to speak in honor of Andrew Smith and his memory. Um, what I want to talk about today is something that, to some extent, many of us has come, have come to take for granted, especially those of you, which is most of you in the audience, who've grown up in a world in which trade, finance, investment, all sorts of economic activities have grown continually. The world has become more and more economically integrated, more and more globalized, so to speak, over the last 30 or 40 years. To the extent that in many ways, many of us take this economic integration for granted. One of the things that's gotten a lot of attention in the US, let me say, to, that, what I want to point out, however, is that this 
globalization is not new, that we've been here before, that the current levels of economic integration, to some extent, take us back to the way the world was integrated in the decades before World War I, before 1914. You see the, the, the U shape here, which indicates that contemporary levels of globalization, to some extent, reflect a level of economic integration that was present in for 40, 50, 60 years before 1914. One of the things that's gotten the most attention in the US lately, and certainly in the current presidential campaign, is the very large increase in immigration into the US. But again, in historical perspective, Contemporary levels of integration of, of immigration and of foreign born in the US seem small if we compare them to what the US looked like and what globalization looked like in the decades before 1914. So what I want to do today, among other things, is talk a bit about that first era of globalization, how it worked, what it implied, what went wrong, and then talk a bit about contemporary economic integration or globalization to see if, first of all, we can learn some lessons from that first era, and second, if we can think about the kinds of pressures and problems that globalization, that globalization is involved with today to anticipate issues that might arise in the future that might threaten contemporary levels of economic integration. Well, first, let's start with that first era of globalization, which is sometimes called the, glo the golden age of economic integration, or globalization mark one. On most dimensions, uh, immigration I've mentioned, the, econ the world economy was very tightly integrated before World War I. Now you can see that the, on the financial front, financial globalization has skyrocketed since about the year 2000. But up to 2000, we were roughly where we were before 1914. In trade, again, we get in the 90s back to where we were in 1913. So we, it could be argued about whether the world is more economically integrated today than it was before 1914, and scholars argue about these things because we get paid to argue about these things. Um, but on a couple of dimensions, there's no question that the world economy was more tightly integrated before 1914 than it is today. The first is immigration. Right? Um, before 1914, before World War I, if you were European, in most instances, you could immigrate to the New World, to the US and most other countries in the New World, with no documents, with no need for a passport. All you had to do was, like my grandparents, show up at Ellis Island with, uh, with, with no documents, again, and prove that you weren't an anarchist and didn't have some terrible communicable disease and weren't insane. And if you pass those three tests, I don't know how they told those, whether you passed those. <laughs> if you passed those three tests, you were in. Right? Which is why there was mass migration before 1914 from Europeans. Migration from Asia was controlled in most of the, of the, of the New World, but in the, for Europeans, migration was almost entirely free. So the world was more tightly tied together in terms of labor flows than it, was, than it is today. The second dimension on which the world was more globalized, if you will, before 1914 than it is today is on the monetary front because the vast majority of the world's leading economies before 1914 were on the gold standard. Now, without going into a lot of detail, the gold standard is a little bit like having a common currency. The currencies were called different things. You had the dollar, the pound sterling, the franc, the, the mark, but they were all freely convertible into gold. So Keynes, in a very famous passage talking about this era, said that, you, that a, a, a wealthy person could travel around the world with nothing but gold coins in his pocket and spend them in virtually every major city in the world. Because every major country in the world, that is, every economy that mattered to some extent in the world, was on the gold standard. 90% of world economic activity, 95% of world trade was among countries on the gold standard. The only two countries 100, as of 100 or so years ago that weren't on the gold standard that mattered economically were China and Persia. But all the others were. So it was a little bit like the euro. A little bit like having a common currency, the gold standard. And the world was tightly integrated on that dimension. So we have a world economy before 1914 where migration, trade, finance, money are very tightly tied together. And this was, by most standards, an extraordinarily successful system. This shows world economic growth from zero, I don't know where they get those numbers from, but uh, to 2000, it comes from Angus Madison, he's estimated them. And you know, for most of human history, economies have grown very, very slowly. 
right? Certainly up until the 17, late 1700s when the Industrial Revolution began, extremely slowly. So this was a world economy from the 1840s to 1914 that was extraordinarily successful. And as you can sort of get a sense of here, the world economy grew more in the 75 years before World War I than it had in the previous 750 years. So this is a period of extraordinarily rapid economic growth. It was also a period of what we would today call convergence. By convergence, we mean that the poorer countries tended to catch up with middle-income countries. Middle-income countries tended to catch up with rich countries. Um, the most striking example is that of Argentina. Argentina started this period as a rural backwater, very poor, and ended in 1914 as the fifth wealthiest country in the world, after only the US, Canada, the UK, and Belgium. It has since fallen back down to about the 50th, but that's a different story. Um, so countries caught up. Now, I don't want to paint too rosy a picture. This is also a period of colonial imperialism, a period of mass starvation in many parts of Europe because there was a big agrarian crisis, a period of pretty miserable conditions in the factory towns of, Euro of Western Europe and North America. Nonetheless, by the standards of the day, comparing it to what the world economy looked like before 1840, let's say, and also what happened after 1914 with 30 terrible years economically and the most devastating world wars in modern history, compared to what came before and compared to what came after, these were pretty good times. And there was a general consensus among the leaders of the Western world and even much of the colonial world that this international economic order, this period of globalization was a good thing and should continue, right? Um, and yet, it all came crashing down in the space of, in the space of a few months um, in 1914. Now, 1914 was World War I. There were attempts to rebuild that classical economic order after the war ended. Um, they were only modestly successful, and then 1929 came along. And as I say, the entire enterprise, the entire structure of the world economy collapsed over a few months. We start, distance from the origin is size of world trade. We start in January 1929, and in September, October, you get the beginnings of a small recession in the United States. It gets transmitted around the world, and the world's leaders realize that something's going wrong, so they start meeting. There are conferences, there are treaties, international organizations are, found, are founded. Um, there are agreements to try to reduce the reduction, the, to reduce the, the, the recession's effect on world trade. There are attempts to stop the, the collapse in the international economy. For five years, all of the world's major countries tried over and over again to stop the decline, and nothing worked. By the end of the period, by 1933, world trade was at one-third the level that it had been before the, this mild recession began in October of 1929. And that was the end of globalization of Mark I. Right. So it was an international economic order that by most standards had some fairly substantial successes that led to greater prosperity than the world had ever known, right, and that eventually collapsed. So we might want to ask ourselves that, ask ourselves why an international economic order that on many dimensions was so successful <laughs> collapsed and could not be restored. Right? So what are the implications for thinking about globalization mark one for the present day? Well, the first thing to point out is that globalization is not some eternal normal state of affairs. It comes and goes. We have lived in a, not we, but our ancestors lived in a highly globalized world economy, and they also lived in a world economy that was very, very closed. But a second implication, probably of more relevance to us today, is that international economic integration is not a normal and natural course of affairs. Now, during the 19th century, it was not uncommon for people to believe and say that the international economy was self-correcting, self-equilibrating, self-balancing. And that may have been true for particular markets, the market for wheat, the market for steel, the market for textiles. Those may have been self-balancing, self-equilibrating. But the world economy as a whole, the international economic order, turned out not to be self-equilibrating. As people looked back on that 19th century, and 19th and early 20th century, what they came to realize was that it held together as an economic order because the major powers cooperated with one another. When there was a crisis in France, 
the French government could turn to the British, German, Dutch, even Russian governments to help deal with the effects of the crisis. If there was a bank run in Germany, the Germans could call upon the Bank of England, the Bank of France, Bank of, of Austria-Hungary to help them deal with the financial crisis in Germany. That the international economic order of the 19th and early 20th century, in other words, relied very heavily on cooperation among the major powers. Right? And that, in turn, relied upon a general agreement within the major powers on the part of domestic, important domestic political actors that making sacrifices at the national level in order to preserve the country's involvement in the world economy was something worth doing. So that if your economy was facing difficulties and you had to impose austerity or undertake a reduction in government spending or bear a recession, let's say, in order to maintain your position in the world economy, you did it. So that was clearly what underpinned the success of the international economic order. And what was found in the 1920s and 1930s was that without cooperation among the major powers, without that domestic support, it was difficult, read impossible, to hold together an integrated economic order. Right? Now, what, what changed? What changed was international politics and domestic politics. On the international level, the big problem that arose after World War I was that the major powers could no longer agree on how to hold the world economy together. There were two aspects of this. The first was the three pillars, the three principal pillars of the world economy before World War I had been France, Germany, and the United Kingdom. After World War I, two of those three pillars could not agree on anything. France and Germany continued to fight all through the 1920s and 1930s, battling over the issues that had separated them on the battlefield and now separated them at the conference table. So there was constant conflict between the French and the Germans, which impeded cooperation on economic issues. A perhaps more important problem was that by the end of World War I, the United States had become the most important economy in the world. It went over the course of World War I from being the world's biggest borrower to being the, biggest, the world's biggest lender right? and the financial center of the world. So the US now, after World War I, comes to dominate the world economy. But as many of you will know, after World War I, having dominated the world economy, having dictated the terms of the armistice and the peace after World War I, having constructed a whole series of international institutions, the League of Nations and others, under the tutelage of Woodrow Wilson, after doing all this, the United States said, never mind, we're not interested, and turned inward in a period of what's called isolationism, refusing to join the League of Nations, refusing to participate in any international economic conferences, refusing to play a role in trying to hold this international economy together. Right? In a, quite an extreme way, the US Congress was so adamant about this that it made it illegal for any agency of the US government to participate in international economic negotiations. So when in 1930, for example, there was a major international agreement to try to deal with some of the financial crises or problems that had arisen after the Great Depression began, the people sitting around the table at the founding of the Bank of International Settlements were the Bank of England, the German Central Bank, the French Central Bank, the Italian Central Bank, the Dutch Central Bank, the Belgian Central Bank, and J.P. Morgan and Company because no official American representative was allowed to be around that table. Well, very hard to sustain cooperation at the international level if two of the three previous pillars can't cooperate and the most important economy in the world isn't involved. And so everything fell apart. Well, fast forward to today, and we are now in, to some extent, a new world of globalization. This animation shows the spread of globalization using one of the common indices of globalization that we see. Darker blue means more globalized. And you can see that as we go through the 70s and into the 80s, and especially after the collapse of the Soviet Union in, in, uh, in 1989 to 91, globalization really increases at an ever more rapid pace. So we're into a new, new world of globalization today, and in this context, we might want to ask ourselves, what can we learn from previous experiences? Now, this is, this is the animation, I'll show you the comparison, 1970 and 2011. So the world is much more economically integrated today than it was uh, 40 years ago, 
to an extent that you probably don't recognize, but some of the older of us in the audience will, will realize. It used to be the case that there were no goods from China. We didn't go into the store and find lots and lots of clothing and toys and furniture from China. China was a non-entity in world markets. In fact, the share of developing country goods sold in the US, manufactured goods in the US, was under 5% for much of that period. Whereas now, they dominate the market for, manufactured, for consumer manufacturers. So there has been this galloping pace of globalization. Now I'm going to lay all my cards on the table and say that I believe, perhaps controversially, that globalization has had massive benefits. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't have problems, but I think it has had massive benefits. When I think of the benefits, however, I don't really think of the benefits to us in the United States. What I think, if you cast your eyes forward 200 years and think of what the world would look like from the vantage point of 2300, let's say, or 20, that's not, uh, 200, 2200, let's say, or 2300, what will those, these past 40 or 50 years look like? What will be the big story? The big story will be that two billion people in China and India and throughout Asia entered the world economy and were lifted out of extreme poverty into what we might think of as being the world's middle class. A couple of numbers just to point that out. In 1979, at, on the more or less the, at the time that China chose to enter the world economy, by most data, two-thirds of the Chinese population lived below what's called the absolute poverty line. Now, the absolute poverty line is something established by the World Bank. At that point, it was $1 a day. Today, it's up to about $1.80 a day in purchasing power parity terms. It's, it's defined as the minimum needed for bare subsistence. Two-thirds of China's population live below the minimum needed for bare subsistence in 1979. Today, 5%. In India, 60% of the population live below that minimum bare subsistence line, that absolute poverty line. Today, 15%. If you add in other countries in East Asia and Southeast Asia, you're talking, as I said before, about something on the order of 2 billion people lifted out of terrible poverty and into something approaching what you might think of the world's middle classes. Right? Um, now, it is unquestionable, in my view, that that could not have taken place without those countries having access to the world's capital, the world's markets, the world's technologies, the world's information, the world's educational systems. So that's the sense in which I think that in a broad international context, globalization is a good thing, recognizing that there are lots and lots of very legitimate criticisms of the contemporary international economy that we could point to. What I want to do now is actually raise some of the questions associated with what might be uh, features of the contemporary international economy that might cause us problems, that might threaten the level of economic integration. So first, just to lay the groundwork, some features, I cannot give in 50 minutes or whatever an overview of the entire international economy, but we'll have time to take some questions and answers in a bit, and I can fill in some of the blanks, I hope. But let me just mention a few things that I think are crucially important in the context of what we're talking about, which is the future, the, the present and future of globalization. The first thing that we should note about the contemporary international economy is there is a very tight, by historic standards, level of commercial, that is, trade integration. That is, most of the world is now involved in trade with most of the rest of the world. And the most striking aspect of this, there's always been, at least since, world, since the 1950s or 60s, been a lot of trade between the North America and Western Europe and Japan. But the most striking development of the past 40 years is the extraordinary increase in trade from developing countries selling manufactured products to the rich world. Developing countries used to be, as the old saying went, drawers of, uh, hewers of wood and drawers of water. That is, they produced raw materials and agricultural products. So before the 1970s, the average view of a developing country was plantations, mines, oil maybe. Now it's factories. Right? And that's an accurate view. The extraordinary increase in exports from low-wage countries is one of the defining characteristics of the contemporary international economy. Now, again, I talked about that having an upward effect on incomes in the developing countries. One result of that, which there's some controversies associated with, but I think it's pretty well established, is, as you would imagine, 
there has been, as a result, some downward pressure on the wages of unskilled workers in rich countries. Now, um, my colleague, Rich Freeman in economics, has a famous article called, Are Your Wages Set in Beijing? in which he points out that bringing two billion low-wage Asian workers into the world's labor force has to put downward pressure on wages of unskilled workers in the US and North America and Western Europe. And I think it has. You know, there are other things as well, high tech, the computer revolution, other aspects of, of, of the labor markets, but the dramatic increase in exports from low-wage countries has put downward pressure on wages in the United States in particular, but more generally in the developed world, and I'll come back to that. So that's one set of factors, commercial integration. Second set of factors is the extraordinarily high level of financial integration, right? a level that was unimaginable even 20 years ago. And I showed the astronomical exponential increase in financial integration uh, after 1990. The extent to which, when I was in graduate school, as, as Mary pointed out, my first project was on the internationalization of banking. And so my, my PhD is from 1984. And at that point, um, we were struck by the fact that something on the order of 30 or $40 billion was being lent out every year in international. That was unheard of. 30, 40, even $50 billion a year lent out in international financial markets. That much is lent out in about three days today. So the extraordinary increase in financial integration is an overwhelmingly important and overwhelmingly striking feature of the contemporary international political economy. And generally speaking, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I'll come back to that. It has a lot of important and positive features. However, that financial integration has been associated with a whole series of technical term capital flow cycles, non-technical term crises, financial crises. 1980s in Latin America, 1990s in East Asia, 1994 in Mexico, 19, 2001, 1998 in Russia, 2001 in Argentina, 2008 in the entire world. Right? So financial crises that seem to recur over and over right, as a result of or associated with this financial integration. So let me just give you a little bit of background on both these things. First, this, is, this shows the evolution of trade with China and manufacturing employment in the United States. Right? Um, as you can see, trade with China was virtually non-existent, even as late as the late 1980s. Right? Today, it has grown spectacularly, and that growth is associated with a decline in manufacturing employment in the US. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the China trade has caused a decline in manufacturing employment, right? but the, con the correlation is there, and sophisticated work by David Autor and his co-authors co has shown that there is a pretty tight relationship between how susceptible or how penetrated a uh, local labor market is by Chinese exports and the decline in manufacturing employment, and to some extent, the decline in wages. This is China's share of world manufacturing activity, just to give you a sense. 1990, not that long ago, China accounted for less than 5% of world manufacturing exports. Today, almost 20% a little bit more than 5% of manufacturing value added, now 25%. China accounts for 25% of the world's manufacturing, from almost nothing to 25%. So a massive change. Also, another set of numbers. This is so-called global imbalances. This shows the extent of international financial flows, and I want to go into a lot of detail about it. The thing I'd point to is we all know how enormous financial flows were in the run-up to the crisis that began in 2007, 2008. We have gone down a bit, but the level of, finan of international financial flows, the level of these global imbalances, which is just a fancy word for financial flows, is still extremely high by historic standards. And that, again, is associated with these recurrent crises. These are the, the financial crises since uh, the, not, the early 1980s up to the present day. You can see that not only are they frequent, but they seem to be increasing in, um, in, in seriousness over time. Okay, so that's the situation we confront. Where do we stand? Remember I started off by, by saying that globalization requ required to some extent uh, a level of cooperation among the major powers and that that in turn relied to some extent on domestic political support for international economic integration. So I wanna take some time to just 
give you some information about what public opinion is now saying about globalization. I'll come back to this again, too. But this is just to, to give you, to, to fix ideas, so to speak. Those of us who've been studying public opinion on these issues for a while know that in the 1990s, there was, there was something called, something close to a, a euphoria about globalization. People talked about the world being flat. They talked about globalization uh, solving the world's problems. They talked, and you can understand it. The Cold War was over. We had won. The world economy was integrated. You had capitalism taking over the entire world. And globalization was at a high point. But starting around 2000, public opinion really pretty much everywhere started to change, including in the United States. And so these are some numbers from public opinion polls in the US before the crisis. I don't want to get into the crisis. This is just before the crisis. In 2006, something like two thirds of Americans thought the distribution of income in the US was not fair. And more than four fifths of those who thought the distribution of income was unfair blamed globalization, importantly, for making the country less fair. Right? Two thirds of Americans thought that globalization was bad for job security, and almost two thirds thought it was bad for job creation. Right? Um, perhaps the most revealing number is the Pew Charitable Trust does a survey every few years of, of between 45 and 50 countries, usually around 47, asking, them, asking people what they think about trade. Are they favorable? Are they unfavorable? Are they, are they neutral? And the US has always been around the middle. But starting around 1999, 2000, American attitudes towards trade got more and more negative until finally in 2006, before the crisis, Americans were the least favorable country in the world of these 47 towards world trade, supplanting the traditional victors, the French, who have always been very reluctant to, about world trade. So we see and continue to see uh, an erosion of the view that international economic activity is a positive force for the United States. And we see very similar trends in almost every developed country the, around the world. So focusing on the US, why might that be the case? Well, I think that a lot of it has to do with the relationship, both in people's minds and to some extent in reality, between globalization on the one hand and inequality on the other. The overriding social fact of the United States since the early 1970s is that the US has become almost continually more unequal since 1973. There's a brief period in the 1990s when inequality, this trend towards increasing inequality is reversed. But for 40, more than 40 years, the country has become increasingly unequal. And many people, including many scholars, would associate large parts of this trend with trends in the international economy and America's role in it. The first is the one that I mentioned before. And this is really the first moment of decline in uh, American real weight or the, the increase in inequality. From the 80s, early 80s, into the early to mid 1990s, the bottom sort of fell out of the American labor market. If you were in the bottom 25 to 30% of the American labor market, unskilled and semi-skilled workers, your wages collapsed not just in relative terms, actually in absolute terms, again, depending on how they're measured, collapsed by something like 15, 20 percent. Right? And again, in the mind of many, certainly those who saw Chinese or Vietnamese or Korean uh, imports supplanting their jobs, and in the minds of many scholars, this collapse in unskilled wages was associated with the rise of imports from uh, low-wage countries in the rest of the world. The second moment of increased inequality starts in the mid to late 1990s and goes on until today, which is rather than the bottom part of the labor market, what happens now is the middle part of the labor market, the middle part of the income distribution, is left farther and farther behind as the top 10, 15, 20 percent get richer and richer. Right? Um, this is associated, again, both among scholars and I think in the general public with what some people call the emergence of a headquarters society, where the best off segments of society are people who are accountants, lawyers, investment bankers, um, managers, and technicians in multinational corporations who are operating in the US at the, in the headquarters of huge international banks and corporations that are ent entirely globalized, some of which actually, for tax reasons, are no longer based in the US, at least officially. Right? Um, so 
what we observe then, and this has gotten a lot of attention in the last couple of years, and certainly in the current campaign, is the belief that there are large international businesses that are employing the best paid, top 10, 15, 20% of the population, that are doing incredibly well in the world economy, while the rest are being left behind. So in the minds of many, I keep saying in the minds of many because there are scholars in the audience who might say, well, the economic evidence is not so clear, but in the minds of many, there is a fairly direct relationship between globalization, on the one hand, and the trends in income inequality. Just again, to give you some numbers, this shows income inequality in the US using both Gini coefficient and the so-called 90-10 ratio, the ratio of 90th percentile to 10th percentile among employed males. And you can see that after the Depression, it reaches a low here, and, and the country stays quite equal until the early 70s, and from the early 70s onward becomes more and more unequal. This is the share of income going to the top 10%. Again, as I said, it stays quite constant until the late 1980s, and then ticks up, and then especially after the, after the mid-1990s, big increase in the share going to the top 10%. But right? well, why should we care about this? Why should we care about income inequality? A lot, of, a lot of debates over, some people would say income inequality is an essential component of capitalism, of a market economy, gives people incentives, has a lot of positive effects. I won't take a position on that, but I will point out the political implications of income inequality. The political implications are very clear. Support for economic integration can be predicted quite well on the basis of income. The poorer people are, the less enthusiastic they are in the United States and in Europe, the less enthusiastic they are about economic integration. This is based on, again, based on Pew and other surveys, attitudes towards free trade agreements. A number of things you can note. The first is Americans don't like free trade agreements, generally. You never get a majority in favor of them, even though they get passed by Congress. Um, but that the wealthiest Americans, are generally favorable. Well, as you go down the income level, you get less and less favorable views on trade agreements, on trade liberalization. Same thing's true about outsourcing international investment, what we would call international investment. Again, you can see that even in the wealthiest groups in the United States, there's not a lot of support for it. But still, there's a pretty direct relationship. These are high income, high education Americans. These are low income, low education Americans that the poorer, less well-educated Americans are, the less positive they feel about international investment. Um, this is asking, this, this set of questions asks, should American companies be allowed to invest overseas? Right? And again, you can see that it, it varies by country. Even the poorer Americans are willing to agree that the American company should be allowed to invest in Europe. But as you go through others, again, the richer people are, the more enthusiastic they are about American companies investing overseas, the poorer they are, the less enthusiastic, which is perfectly understandable. Syracuse is probably a good example where lots and lots of industrial jobs have left for places like Korea or China or Mexico, and people are quite conscious of the fact that their wages are always being constrained by the threat that the, that the company can move to a lower wage environment. One of the aspects of this is Concern, again, which has come up in the presidential campaign about what's happened with finance. This is wages in the finance. Tom Pilipon at the NYU has done some really interesting studies of what's going, what's going on with compensation, wages, salaries in the financial sector. You can see they decline continually as the country gets more equal, and then they start rising in the 1980s. Um, Philippon then goes on to try to relate that to what's happening with regulation. As finance is deregulated, wages in the financial sector rise dramatically. And then he did an even more interesting study, I think, to me, which is he took, he matched people working in finance with people working outside finance with sim very similar educational backgrounds. So these are people who went to Harvard Business School or to the Maxwell School or somewhere else. And he matched, matched into thousands and thousands and thousands of individuals to try to see whether there was a difference in the salary they were earning, which he calls a wage, salary they were earning inside finance or outside finance. And he said, listen, the difference is an excess wage, is something that's being earned just by virtue of being in, in this deregulated financial sector. And so what this shows is that this is a 40, this up here before the crisis is 40%, shows that identical and more or less identical individuals in finance and outside, or let me put it, let me, let me say that grammatically. 
that if you take more or less identical individuals, those in finance are earning 40% more than those outside finance simply by virtue of being in the booming financial sector. Okay? So there are these longer term trends that have tended to undermine support for economic integration. And then there are the more immediate trends, more immediate processes like the recurrence of debilitating financial crises over and over and over again over the last 35 to 40 years. Now, I want to say, Petronius notwithstanding, Polonius rather notwithstanding, or Shakespeare, whoever you want to attribute it to, that being a debtor is not necessarily a bad thing. Being a lender is not necessarily a bad thing. In a normal economy, um, there's nothing wrong with borrowing. There's nothing wrong with lending. If a firm borrows to make a productive investment, then both the firm and the lender can be better off. If a country borrows in order to increase its economic activity and its ability to service its debt, then it can be better off. The US was largely developed in the 19th century by borrowing from the rest of the world. We were the world's largest borrower all through the 19th century. Um, one of the great things that Alexander Hamilton did was make the US a creditworthy country. And on that basis of that creditworthiness, the US borrowed what we would today, in today's money, would be trillions and trillions of dollars to build the canals and the ports and the railroads and the factories. So our development relied on investors in Europe lending to us in order to invest productively. So international capital flows are, can be a very good thing, but debt crises are not such a good thing. Debt crises such as those we've come to know over the past 35 years and some such as what we are living through or what Europeans are living to, through and what we lived through between 2007 and 2010 are not good. And they have a number of very debilitating effects on economies. They have some very direct economic effects. A debt crisis is different than a normal recession on a lot of dimensions. One way it's different is economically. A debt crisis, unlike a normal recession, leaves the society in question with a debt overhang, that is, with a burden of accumulated debts that have to be dealt with. But as I was saying to some people before, the financial institutions, with all these bad debts on their books, are trying to figure out how they can clean up their balance sheets. And they're not interested in lending. Right? So if we think of today in Europe, or today in North America, but certainly in Europe, you have banks that have trillions of dollars of debts, some of which they know are bad, others of which they're worried might be bad. And if you're in that position and you're a bank, you're not going to make any new risky loans. You're going to get rid of all the bad loans and not make any new. So banks aren't lending. On the debtor side, you've got trillions of dollars of debts that the debtors have to service. And so if you have to service your debts, you have to cut back on something. And the something you cut back on is consumption. So in a, the aftermath of a debt crisis, banks aren't lending, consumers aren't spending. And that's why debt crises take typically at least five times as long to recover from than normal recessions. The average debt crisis, recovery from the average debt crisis is five and a half years. Recovery from the average normal recession is nine months. Right. So the debt overhang has these massive economic effects. Debt crises also have massive political effects because every debt crisis in history, as far as I know, leads to massive political conflict over who will bear the burden of adjustment. That is, who's going to make the sacrifices necessary to deal with this enormous debt? Is it going, if it's an internet, then on two dimensions. Internationally, you've got creditor countries and debtor countries. So the creditor countries want to get paid back. The debtor countries want to have their debts reduced. We see that today in Europe. It's Germany against Greece, the Netherlands against Portugal. Right? Um, so there's international conflict over how this debt burden will be distributed, who will pay the price for these debts. And then within countries, there is conflict. Inside Spain, is it going to be taxpayers? Is it going to be public sector employees? Is it going to be beneficiaries of government programs, the private sector, the public sector? So debt crises always lead to political conflict. Sometimes very difficult political conflicts that don't always end up the way we might like them to. Every European debtor country, as of 1929, went fascist. Every single one. Right? And as you may recall, not recall, may know from your history, that the fascist movements, whether they were the Nazis in Germany or the neo-fascists in much of Eastern Europe or the fascists in Southern Europe, part of their appeal was that they were hostile to international bankers, 
hostile to the world economy, hostile to the evil, evil foreigners who were screwing every last dollar or mark or yen or, or euro, not euro, uh, or pound out of the debtor countries. Right? So debt crises are both economic and political problems. Right? Because they give rise to uh, uh, conflict over the distribution of the adjustment burden. In the recent crisis, we've seen major conflicts in the United States, again, just to fix ideas about how debt crises can give rise to domestic conflict. Um, the experience of the crisis was highly differentiated among segments of the population. Now, the experience of the, of the boom, so without going into detail about what happened in the US in the, in the 2000s, between 2001 and 2007, we had an expansion. The country borrowed between half a, billion, half a trillion and a trillion dollars a year from the rest of the world. Uh, we used it primarily for current consumption, especially in the housing market, big increases in asset prices. We also ran big budget deficits. Um, in other words, we sort of wasted the money. Uh, in that period of expansion between 2001 and 2007, there was economic growth, but two-thirds of that economic growth went to the top 10% of the population. So even in the good times, right, it, the, the benefits of economic growth were unequally distributed. Right? Um, now, so you think of it the other way around, during that period of expansion, the top 1% of the population saw their incomes rise by 60%. The remaining 99% of the population saw their incomes rise by 6%. And all of that was wiped out by the crisis that began in December of 2007. So when the crisis hit, things got even worse. Um, this shows one thing. I'm going to talk you through another example of the, of the unequal distribution of the burden of the crisis in the US. If you think of the, at, at its peak, trough, whatever, the worst time of the crisis, unemployment in the US was 10%, um, which is high by American standards. Now imagine the American labor market divided in thirds, the third richest households, third poorest households, third in the middle. Among the third poorest households in the US at the peak of the crisis, unemployment was 18%. Then we add to that underemployment. Underemployment is made up of so-called um, involuntary part-time workers, which means people who would like to work full-time but can't find full-time work, and just so-called discouraged workers, which is people who've been looking for work for two years and have basically dropped out of the labor market as a result. So if you add unemployment plus underemployment at the peak of the crisis in the bottom third of the, of the, of the households, it reaches 38%. So 38% of the population of, the, of these households was either, uh, suffering either unemployment or underemployment. Now, in the top third, of households, the unemployment rate never went above 4%, even at the peak of the crisis. And if you add unemployment plus underemployment, it went in a, never went above 8%. So you have 38% in the bottom third of households, 8% in the top third. And you can imagine why some people at the height of the crisis felt the government wasn't doing enough, and other people felt at the height of the crisis that the government was doing way too much. If you're in that top third, you're saying, why are we doing all this? Why are we incurring all this debt that we, as the principal taxpayers, are going to have to pay back when things aren't really so bad? Now, the crisis took a different form in Europe in the sense that, unlike in the US, where the principal differentiation that we think about is among income groups, in Europe was among countries. Now, I have to say, we're used to thinking of Europe as Germany against Spain and the Netherlands against Greece and all these conflicts among countries, and I'll get back to that in a moment. There's no inherent reason why we in the United States couldn't have had in the aftermath of the crisis uh, a process whereby we in New York or in Massachusetts said, why should we? the hardworking people of New York, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, bail out those lazy and stupid South Floridians and Arizonans and Californians that got themselves into difficulty. That's what the, that's what the Europeans are saying, by the way. Right? We could have said that in the US because that's exactly what happened. The borrowing was done almost exclusively, and the boom and the bubble, which burst, was, was almost exclusively in places like South Florida, Arizona, Southern California, places like that. And the money came almost exclusively from places like New York and Massachusetts and, and Chicago. Uh, 
But we didn't because the US is, organized, is not organized on these kinds of regionalist lines, and there's a certain sense of national solidarity. Not so in Europe. So this is the European crisis. This is the trend of per capita GDP once the crisis began, centered at, at, at uh, zero. You can see this is Greece. So even with recovery, such as it is, per capita income in Greece is still 20% below where it was when the crisis began. And the crisis began eight, nine now years ago. So nine years after the crisis began, Greeks are still 20% poorer. This um, is Italy, Spain, the only country that's really doing better than it was before the crisis is Germany, 8%. Right? Europe as a whole, just to give you an example, Europe as a whole, if you, if you think of the crisis beginning at the end of 2007, so that's about eight or nine years ago, take 1929 to 1937. In those eight or nine years, the European economy had recovered by about 10%. Today, the European economy is still, on average, and in aggregate, below where it was before the crisis began. So Europe is doing worse today than it did in the 1930s, which helps explain why there's been so much political unrest and political conflict in Europe. Unemployment is a good indicator of how poorly these economies are doing. And you can see, this is, this is Japan. This is the US. We had a high unemployment rate, around 10%. And now it's come way down to, to below around 5%. But you can see that unemployment in the Eurozone as a whole is well above 11%. Right? That is the entire Eurozone together. It's way above 20% in Spain. It's way above 20% in, in Greece. Right? Youth unemployment, which in some sense is the saddest of all unemployment statistics, is astronomical. Almost 50% in Greece, 45% in Spain. Right? So in Spain, at one point, it had reached 55% on average, youth, youth being defined as 18 to 25, not in educational institutions. Right? So at one point, as I said, it was 55%, 60% among Spanish young women. And a Spanish friend of mine pointed out that what that meant in reality was that two-thirds of Spanish women between the ages of 18 and 24 had never had a job. And we know that those first few years in employment really are a very powerful determinant of life lifetime earnings. So this is not just a lost decade. This is now a lost generation in much of Europe, much of especially southern, central, and eastern Europe. Right? So the, all of this helps explain why there has been such growing discontent in Europe. Um, and I'm going to describe a little bit of what's going on. This is just to anticipate. Europeans still like the European Union. They still like European integration. They still like the globalization that they've experienced within Europe. They want that. They, if, they're, if they're in the Euro, they still like the Euro. But there are big differences among groups in society between poor and rich Europeans. Uh, much bigger than the differences among countries. And perhaps most important, throughout Europe, virtually everywhere, there has been an extraordinary collapse in the extent to which European citizens trust their governments, think that their governments are doing a good job, think that their democracies are functioning. And we see that in some of the elections that have taken place or, or are taking place or will take place in Europe. So just to give you some data along these lines, this is um, the, the two lines probably most, most worthy of attention are the solid blue line and the dashed red line. And that's support for European monetary integration for EMU. This is just to give you some ideas. Um, I can go into more detail if anyone's interested, right? So support for the euro remains strong. The blue and red lines are countries in the eurozone, even though the crisis has been very severe. That's even true among the most heavily affected countries. The solid blue line here is Ireland. And it looks like it drops, and it does drop. But it drops from 90% to 70% and then recovers. So even in the most heavily affected countries by the Eurozone crisis, there is still very strong support for the Euro. People like the Euro. They like European integration. They like the idea of the common currency. Now, there is differentiation by education. Here, just to give you an example, this is the creditor countries. Are, are again blue, and the, the debtor countries are red. What you can see here, just to put country names on this, is that highly educated, and I'll show you in the next slide, um, highly skilled Germans, 
have very similar views to highly educated, highly skilled Spaniards. Poorly educated and low-skilled Germans have very similar views to poorly educated and low-skilled Spaniards. So the differences, the, 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 the disagreements, if you will, among Europeans, even though they appear to be Germany versus Spain, are much more high-skilled, high-education um, workers in one country and uh, others in other countries. So this is the trust, uh, the, the development in trust. And it's especially striking in the debtor countries. At the outset, before the crisis, the blue line is trust in the institutions of the European Union. The red line is trust in national governments. So you have 80% of the population. And there are, there are like 15 different uh, questions that people ask, that not people, that Eurobarometer asks. So no matter what, what question you ask, 80, 75 to 80% of the population expresses a level of trust in the institutions of the European Union. By 2014, it's down to about 20%, from 75 to 20%. Um, trust in national governments goes from 60% to about 15%. Right? And that, I think, helps explain some of the trends that we see in European politics today, where movements like the National Front in France, like the extreme right in Poland, like other political movements that call into question, in some sense, the whole structure of the post-war international economy, and even, in some instances, democracy, are increasingly powerful. I want to close up so as I don't go over uh, and leave time for questions and answers. But there's lots more that could be said about the political trends in the US and in Europe and how they relate to this issue of globalization, economic integration, frustration with national governments. But let me just sum up. Um, even Europe will eventually come out of the crisis. I hope, we hope, undoubtedly it will happen. But in its aftermath, there will still be major challenges to international economic integration. Right? Um, and history, both the history of globalization Mark I and history of more recent experiences demonstrates, I think, that international economic integration depends upon cooperation among the major economic and financial centers. If countries and governments don't cooperate, the world economy does not stabilize itself. Crises don't solve themselves. The crisis that began in December 2007 and that reached its peak financially in October of 2008, almost certainly, uh, let, me, let me say, I am positive that if it had not been for systematic, purposive, cooperative measures among the major monetary authorities established at the G7 and G20 meetings in, in the fall of 2008, if it had not been for those measures, the crisis would have been much more severe than the Great Depression of the 1930s. Now, there is some econometric evidence by Barry Aiken Green and others to that effect. I'm convinced, we can argue about it, but I'm convinced that without the levels of cooperation we saw in 2008, 2009, which quickly dissipated, but at least they were there in 2008, 2009, the crisis would have been much, much more severe. So cooperation is crucial. But governments have constituents. A government that doesn't respond the desires demands, needs of its constituents does not remain a government for very long. It gets voted out of office. So governments have to respond, have to respond to their constituents, and they can only really credibly commit to cooperate with one another if they have enough domestic support for the measures, sometimes very difficult measures, necessary to sustain international economic cooperation. Today, unfortunately, I would say, that both dimensions have major weaknesses. Cooperation among the major powers reached its high point in 2008, early 2009. It has gotten less and less solid over time, called into more and more question. The domestic political support for measures necessary to sustain international economic integration has, has gotten weaker and weaker over time, and in some countries has almost entirely disappeared so that the two pillars that I've pointed to as being essential to the, the maintenance of an integrated international economy, that is cooperation among the major powers and domestic political support for the measures necessary to undertake that cooperation, both those pillars have weakened, I think, quite dramatically in the past 10 years. And that, I think, means that there are interesting times to come. So on that happy note, I will stop and see if folks have questions 
that I might be able to answer. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jeff, for such a fascinating talk. Oh, thank you. I was looking for that. Yeah. We are going to have a mic for questions and answers. I hope you have a lot of questions from Professor Friedman. Um, this is going to help with that. Uh, if you raise your hand, Jeff, would you like to call on people? Oh, sure. I don't know anyone's and name, so. I know your name, Margarita. <laughs> Can you bring the mic over? Oh. She's loud, but you'll, she'll need to. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's off. It should be on the news. Yes. Um, well, so uh, you know, it's a fascinating talk. So this was just you know very interesting. And because I don't do international political economy, and I do uh, um, you know just comparative you know comparative politics. Right. You know, I just wanted to just pick up where you sort of left, that, that you've just talked about the dismal picture of politics in Europe, and also uh, what we are just seeing today with Trump. Um, you know, that just goes just very, you know, it's, it's quite sort of similar to what goes on in Europe, that what might just, um, you know, just the, the support of radical right that exists in Europe might be equivalent to uh, what we are just seeing now sure. in the US in terms of support for Trump. And because of the, the American sort of party system and electoral system, primaries just is a very unique situation where we can just see these sort of pockets of uh, support groups. Um, so what do you think? So you, you, know, you have uh, told us about all these sort of factors that are uh, weakening the conditions that support international cooperation, and the picture that we see isn't that uh, sort of pretty. And Europe is also facing, in addition to economic crisis, there is added um, stress of immigration sure. that are going to strengthen radical right in these countries. And what is particularly worrying is that even within sort of Western Europe, it's the wealthy countries that are going radical right. For instance, in Spain, you might just see a rise in radical left, but not radical right. right. It tends to be sort of wealthy Western European countries. And this is particularly worrying because these are the countries that are pillars for uh, international corporations. So I just wanted to, uh, to Right, ask no, I, I think uh, there was a question in there somewhere, I think, uh, Margarita. Uh, I, so let me, let, let me rephrase that as a question, which is what are the implications of these trends for development, political developments in Europe particularly? And we can talk about the US as well. So I think it's very, one of the things that you point to do I think is very interesting and very true. The, the tendency has been that in the debtor countries, the crisis has been associated with the rise of the radical left, while in the creditor countries, the crisis has been associated with the rise of the radical right. right? And that makes some sense. So the radical left says, we're getting screwed because we're being forced to service debts that we didn't benefit from, that were incurred by you know, bad governments or bad private corporations that we didn't participate in, it reminds me of, um, I was in Brazil during the 1980s debt crisis, and there was a famous episode when the, it was still dictatorship. The, the, the military dictator of Brazil went on television and made a big, famous speech in which he said, Brazilians, this is introducing austerity measures, Brazilians have to understand that the party's over. And the next day on the streets of Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, there are these huge demonstrations and the banners read, the party's over and we weren't even invited, right? So you have a situation in places like Spain and Portugal and Greece where workers, the working class, middle classes, middle class government employees are being asked to make major sacrifices and they were not the ones that benefited from the borrowing boom, right? So that's led to a big rise in the radical left in, in Spain, you have the rise of this new party, Podemos. In Portugal, you have a new government, which includes both the former Communist Party and a group even to the left of the former Communist Party. And in Greece, of course, you have the rise of Syriza. Um, then in the creditor countries, you have taxpayers saying, why, should we being, why are we being asked to bail out these banks? I mean, it's very similar to the US. Why are, why are the German banks, the Dutch banks, the Belgian banks being bailed out by, government, by our government with our taxpayer money. And so you have savers and taxpayers on the right joining these kinds of populist movements. So I think that's, that's, that's where things have been heading. And the reality is that the Europeans have done an incredibly poor job of managing their debt crisis. They've done a poor job on every 
possible dimension you can imagine. They've done a poor job on a purely technical dimension. Every debt crisis, if you look at Reinhardt and Rogoff's book, the uh, famous book, that statistical study of 180 debt crises in the last 150 years, every debt crisis in their sample ends up with a major debt restructuring. Because everybody understands that that's how international debt works. Countries borrow. If they run into difficulties, then you renegotiate the debts. There's no international bankruptcy court, so you do something like a bankruptcy court. This is the first debt crisis that I know of in modern history in which, with the exception of Greece, there has been no debt restructuring. And that's insane. That means that the Spaniards and the Portuguese and the Irish are being asked to bear the entire burden. And you know, I get in trouble when I go to Germany because the Germans all say, oh, well, they were irresponsible borrowers. It was terrible. Said, Come on. For every irresponsible borrower, there was an irresponsible lender. And I don't know which is more ethically or morally suspect to be an irresponsible lender or an irresponsible borrower. The German banking system, the German, Dutch, Belgian, French banking systems extended crazy loans just like the American banks did. Right? So, and, and so there's been no debt restructuring, which means that all of the burden is being thrown onto the backs of the, the debtor countries. And then the other thing that they've mishandled is what the Germans call the public diplomacy of the crisis. When the crisis erupted, the German government said, well, this is a crisis that was caused by lazy Greeks and lazy Spaniards and lazy Portuguese, and we hardworking Germans are going to have to bail them out. The reality was that the reason there was a bailout in Europe was that the crisis threatened the stability of the German, Belgian, Dutch banking system. In other words, we had in the US a big financial boom with the housing bubble and then a crisis, and we bailed out the banks. And the Europeans had a big financial boom and a housing bubble and a crisis, and they bailed out the banks. Only in Europe, they didn't call it a bailout of the banks. They called it a bailout of Spain and Greece and Portugal. And so the average German does not understand that People in Spain, Portugal, and Greece didn't get this money. The money went to the German banks. Right? That the German taxpayers were bailing out not Greeks or Spaniards or Portuguese, but German financial institutions. And that misunderstanding has made it almost impossible for there to be forward movement in Europe in trying to resolve this debt crisis. So it's very depressing. Um, the, the obstacles to a constructive resolution of the crisis appear insurmountable. The only positive note, building on something you said, Margarita, the only positive note is that people's attention has been pulled away from this by the refugee crisis. So maybe they can do something while people are paying attention to the refugees and to try to resolve the debt crisis. But if things keep going the way they are, I can only anticipate an increased polarization of European politics, which is not a good thing. Uh, back there. Oh, wait, use the mic, use the mic. All right, so first I have to ask, uh, <coughs> sorry, just a bit sick. <coughs> uh, <coughs> are you aware of what BDS is, by any chance? Yes. So ignoring the political factors, economically, you mentioned that for Europe and the rest of the world to <coughs> get back on its feet and stand together as a global economy, we would have to stand together. Do you view BDS as <coughs> a factor that's working in opposition to that? Or would you say that it's not a factor at all? It's not a factor at all. It's, uh, it has to do with uh, different opinions as to how the best way to move forward in resolving the Arab-Israeli conflict is. And there are legitimate views on all sides of that issue. And it doesn't really have much. I mean, Israel, I hate to say it, that Israel, almost no country in the Middle East, including Israel, is particularly important to the world economy. They're very small. They certainly don't play much of a role in international financial markets or international trade. I mean, you know, be honest about it. It's really the, the G7 and a few others that matter. It's the group of seven, that is North America, Western Europe, Japan, and then China, India, Brazil, maybe sometimes Russia. That's the world economy. I mean, I'm not to be dismissive of other countries, but that's the world economy. So what happens, everybody would like there to be a resolution of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Everybody in the world, as far as I know, would like there to be a resolution of some sort, but it's not a major international economic issue. There. Uh, where's the mic? Yeah, there. 
so uh, thank you, Professor, for this talk. So my question is, to what extent do you think there is an optimal or equilibrium amount of globalization that A, unleashes enough potential for growth, and B, uh, constrains its effect on inequality, and C, sustains enough institutional and popular support for the system? In other words, where is nirvana these days, right? <laughs> um, so, um, so uh, listen, these issues are not technical issues, they're political issues. Technically speaking, um, a long-standing precept of both trade and international economic relations more generally is any policy that is good for the country can be achieved by having, because every policy creates winners, almost every policy creates winners and losers. So if you have a policy that's good for the country and it creates winners and losers, all you have to do is compensate the losers out of the gains from the winners. So if we, in the United States, the general view would be, by economists would be, that trade integration, our trade with China, has been fantastic for the country as a whole. Just think of all the cheap goods we get. Think of all the consumption we can engage in. Think of all the iPods and iPads we can buy because China is part of the world economy. So there are many, many winners in the US, and there are losers. What the technical response to that would be, tax the winners and use those funds to, bet, to compensate the losers for their losses. And then everybody's better off. So there is a Pareto per improvement available. Try to do that politically. <laughs> Try to say, gee, you guys in finance, you the wealthy people in Silicon Valley, biotech, so on, you've been the winners of globalization. So we're going to raise your tax rate to 60% and use some of that to benefit the losers in Syracuse and Schenectady and Cleveland and Pittsburgh. It's not politically, well, it may, not, may be politically feasible, but so far it has not proved to be politically feasible. But the, I think the challenge is, and this, you know, Margarita is a good resource on this, the challenge is how do you achieve an agreement that compensates those who are negatively affected by global economic integration right, um, that is politically feasible and that sustains the process of forward movement in economic integration and globalization. It'll vary by country. So you know, people talk about the Scandinavian or Northern European countries as a positive uh, example because they have typically worked out compensation mechanisms. But you know, can you really compare a Denmark with the United States? Denmark is very small, quite homogeneous. U.S. is huge, very heterogeneous. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. But I think the, 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 the real answer to your question is there's, there are plenty of perfectly straightforward technical fixes or technical answers, but the real challenge is a political one. How do you get the winners to agree that compensating the losers is worth doing? Now, there have been in, in, instances in time where that's happened. There have been instances in which, you know, to put it bluntly, the rich had been worried enough about unrest among the poor that they'd been willing to do things like fund a welfare state or social welfare policies or social welfare programs. So maybe if Podemos and Syriza and groups like that get strong enough, the winners from globalization in Europe at least will say, okay, you know, how are we gonna keep them down on the farm? Not down on the farm, but how we, how we, how we try to mitigate some of the social unrest, we have to engage in more generous social policies, more generous social programs. At the global level, one issue that keeps coming up is, is the current level of financial integration optimal? Is our world financial markets too integrated? And I would say that opinion has changed on that in the last 10 years, if, or 15 years. 15 years ago, if you'd asked the IMF to, to anthropomorphize the IMF, you'd ask the IMF, or the leaders of the IMF, uh, what the optimal level of global economic integration was or whether countries should have capital controls, controls on cross-border capital ones, they would say absolutely not, uh, no limits, no regulations. Today, the IMF is much more sympathetic to saying there are times when it would make sense to control capital movements because we keep getting these huge bubbles that burst and the costs are much greater than the benefits. So there's a lot of discussion these days about what should be done 
to try to ensure whether through regulation or through limits or through something else, cooperation, macroeconomic policy co coordination cooperation, to try to limit the extent of capital movements around the world. Uh, I think, wait, wait, wait for the mic. Here you go. All right, so I, I know you mentioned, er, I know you mentioned earlier um, trends of globalization in the past century. You said before 1914, we saw a very high upward trend in globalization, and then it dipped again after the war. And then, but most recently, we've had another peak or trough. Um, I want to ask: so going from now 2016 on forward, let's let's say, like you said, maybe until 2200, do you still see another dip or peak? <laughs> like, uh, well, I could very confidently make a prediction about 2200. There's no one's going to be around to call me on it. Um, generally speaking, I prefer to predict the past, right, which I can predict with great accuracy. I think, you know, this is what we're, we're the question you're asking, let's not say 2200, let's say 2150 or 2140, uh, 2040, you know, that is 25, 20, 25 years from now. I prefer to be an optimist. I think that there are major problems, but I think that there have been some pretty, there are some positive developments. There has been some cooperation. There have been some positive trends in domestic political arenas. If we look at today's world, comparing it to the 1980s, let's say, when we were in the midst of the Cold War, where military spending was many times what it is today, when the kinds of militarized conflicts that were at least thought about were much more serious in many ways than they are today, Things look better, and, and, and lots of countries and lots of people are much better off today than they were 30 years ago. So I'm optimistic. I think there is cause for concern, but I do think that I, I don't, I hope, certainly hope, I don't think that we will fall into another Great Depression, but the challenge is there, and the, and the threat is always there. So I'm optimistic, but guardedly so. Um, in the white shirt, I saw. Hi, thanks again for coming. Um, I wanted to get your take on the economic, or the Eurasian Economic Union and Russia's recent attempts to pressure former Soviet states in joining. Um, do you see any chance of Russia ever becoming an integral part of the international political economy, or, do you, or is Russia just too um, corrupt and too privatized <laughs> to actually integrate with the EU specifically? Um, right today, Russia is clearly on a path that sets it off from the broader trends in the world economy, and especially the European economy. It's not the only country that's on such a path, but it has certainly um, chosen a, a form of economic organization and a form of relationship with the rest of the world that is not conducive to cooperative, positive relations with the, with Western Europe and North America. However, despite the continued popularity of President Putin, or Mr. Putin now, um, Russia has a lot of economic problems. Russia boomed for 20 years because of a boom in commodity prices. And Russia basically became one huge commodity producer, deindustrialized. It did not diversify. It does not have a diversified economy. It does not have a diversified manufacturing base. And that's one of the major reasons why its economy has collapsed. Now, my view, I mean, not to be too much of an economic determinist, but my view is that governments don't usually stay all that popular all that long when their economies collapse. So I think, this is, this is going to sound like the wrong thing to say. Um, the op, what I, one could say that one might be optimistic about the future of Russian economic policy and Russia's role in the world economy because the current government is likely to start losing substantial political support. But you know, we've seen plenty of instances in which governments, authoritarian or semi-authoritarian governments, have lost political support that have not ended well. Right? So just, be, just, just Putin just losing support doesn't necessarily mean that things are going to go in a, in a positive direction. So continuing my previous optimism, I would say my hope is that in some way, maybe under Putin himself, the Russians will see that they can no longer rely on $150 oil and a continual boom in the demand for their raw materials. Uh, 
Um, and they are going to have to start developing technological, financial investment ties with the rest of the world if they want to continue to grow, because they're not growing now, and they haven't grown for several years. And, and that optimistic scenario we want that would lead to a gradual reduction in tensions and perhaps a gradual increase in economic ties and cooperation. We see a little bit of that in um, some of the reduction in tensions over Syria, for example, and Iran. So not all, not all the signals are negative. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, we have OK, yeah, no, I'll answer. Uh, OK, here. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> um, so my question is on more looking at like social, um, social insurance and social policy for like inequality um, and looking at the development of European markets, um, US, Latin America and China and also Japan in particular. Um, we see like as countries develop, they face um, lots of inequalities or like for Japan case of like their, um, their immor immortality rates and the birth rates. So do we see like that trend being a pattern or a template for other countries that is still trying to reach that development, high development stage? Yeah, so this is, um, there's a very, very stable relationship between income and uh, population growth and family size. So as countries get richer, family size goes down. The Europeans and the Japanese have reached a point where the population is actually declining. Um, not the US, but, but most of Western Europe, most of Europe and Japan are not above what we call replacement rate. You need 2.1, 2.2 children per family, per couple, to be at replacement rate. And, it, and much of Europe is well below that and, and Japan's below that. What has saved the US is immigration. Not only because immigrants are younger than the average population, but because immigrants tend to have more children than the average population. And this is not just a problem. It's not just a problem in the sense that we say, oh, it's too bad if the population is declining. Um, it's a problem because that demographic trend means that these societies are getting older and older, more and more old people. And it's becoming increasingly difficult in a place like the Netherlands or Germany or Japan for the workers in the workforce to support the elderly and their pension systems, Social Security in the American context. American Social Security, with all its problems, is roughly speaking solvent because of immigrants who contributed Social Security, the immigrants and their children, younger people who contributed Social Security. There are expectations that many of the European pension Social Security systems will be bankrupt in 20 years because there aren't enough young people. So the Pollyanna-ish view is the Europeans should be wel welcoming all these refugees and all these migrants because they're the salvation for the labor markets of these countries. They need labor. They need young people. They need new, new blood. But that ignores some of the cultural and other factors involved in the re response to the immigration, cri the refugee crisis. Uh, 